Welcome to Brain in a Vat. Um, the show is hosted by myself, Mark Oppenheimer, and uh, Jason Werbelov, a, a prominent sci-fi writer and philosopher. I'm a mere humble lawyer. So we're continuing our series by um, playing around some thought experiments, and I'm going to start with, uh, with an interesting one. So imagine this. You wake up in a hospital bed, and you are covered head to toe in bandages, and you've got a very severe case of amnesia. So much so that you don't remember your name, you don't remember uh, your age, even what sex you are, or your race, or your religion. But you have some basic understanding of human psychology and of, of economics. So you're lying in bed, sort of, you know, trying to piece the world together, and a doctor walks into the room. And he says, I'm going to give you a once in a lifetime opportunity. Oh, what's that? He says, I'm going to let you design the rules for the world that you step into. So you can basically design what um, the democratic system looks like, whether it's democratic or authoritarian, um, what laws will apply to everybody. Um, but bear in mind this sort of veil of ignorance that you have, these bandages over you. So there's certain things you don't know about yourself. So for example, um, you might not want to design a society in which uh, men will be treated much better than women because you might be a woman. You might not want to design a society that was incredibly racist. Uh, because you might be in the disfavored race or one that persecutes religious minorities um, because you, you might be in that minority group. So the idea is that you're going to be incentivized through a process of rationality to pick certain kinds of principles. And the first principle that we're going to pick is this one of um, everyone having a basic set of equal rights. Um, now, the person who came up with this thought experiment is a uh, famous philosopher, John Rawls. He's one of the uh, big liberal political philosophers. And today, Jason and I are going to talk about um, the use of this thought experiment and how it applies to um, a post-COVID world. So it's, it's quite a brilliant experiment because, you know, the problem with putting people around a table and asking them to decide on behalf of society as a whole, how we're going to run things, is that each of those people around the table is biased, right? So if I'm wealthy, I'm not going to want to be taxed. And if I'm poor, I am going to want taxes so that I can get help from the state. And if I'm male, I'm going to want extra privileges. And if I'm female, I'm going to want to make sure that there's gender equality or maybe privileges for women. But the original, the original um, experiment, the, the, uh, Rawls's idea, is so clever because what it does is it removes any bias from the people engaged in the discussion because they're under this veil of ignorance. And the veil of ignorance makes sure that they don't know who they are, so they can't argue in a biased way. It's very, very clever. Yeah, so, I mean, the idea is we, we sort of imagine, you know, what this world would be like, um, and it sort of puts us in a position where we're trying to pick these, these fair principles, these, you know, just principles. And Rawls thinks it's not only about, you know, what kinds of rules we would have regarding rights. He thinks it's this, this very classical liberal principle about the idea that, I should have the freedom to swing my fist at the edge of your nose and no further. Um, that we must have mutually compatible freedoms. Um, so I must be free to do what I like, provided I don't intrude on your freedoms. But he also thinks that there's some economic consequences. And he's called a, a liberal egalitarian. So in the sense that you care about freedom, but you also care about equality. And he asked us to imagine a couple of different ways in which we could distribute um, resources in a society. So he thinks that the one is you say everybody gets the same stuff. Um, you all get an equal amount of things. That's sort of, let's say, the, the pure communist model. And he thinks, no. Um, the, the problem with that kind of equality is that you often end up um, tempering down growth um, and, and the sort of levels of prosperity that some people could have if they were allowed to exceed you know, the equal amount of resources. But he does think people should have uh, a fair equality of opportunity. So you shouldn't be held back from participating in the economy because you're black or because you're a woman um, or because you, you know, come from a certain ethnic group. We should all be free to compete. I think that's important. He also then thinks that um, we can have some levels of redistribution. He thinks that what you want to do is cater for the least advantage in society. So when we're distributing things, we should make sure that we can have differences uh, because that generally leads to some level of prosperity. But the, the worst off must be kept in mind, and we mustn't undermine them too much when we're allowing for our prosperity. So, for example, we might have some level of redistributive taxation, so we can take from 
from the from the wealthy, and we can ensure that the poor are, are given some money so that they can subsist, um, as opposed to just sort of letting you know letting people accumulate as much as they're able to. Yeah. So so basically, what what you're saying, what Rawls is saying, is that the people in this original position, not knowing who they are, are going to choose two basic principles. So the one basic principle is that everyone gets an equality of liberty. So everyone can do whatever they want, so long as they're harming no one else. And the second one is this principle of difference, this idea that the people at the bottom should, they can have less than people at the top, but they should have enough. So he thinks that if you have a look at a society where everyone gets the same, yeah, the people at the bottom get more than they would have, but society as a whole, the cake is smaller, the economy is bad. But if you have differences in society, that, that results in a bigger cake, but you want to make sure the people at the bottom, when they wake up from the thought experiment, when they wake up and the amnesia lifts and they take off the bandages, if they're at the bottom, they need enough to survive. So that's what he calls the principle of difference. So he thinks in the original position, these two principles will be chosen. So now, you know, a lot, an enormous amount of, of philosophy, of politics, of economics, um, of, of law has been based around Rawls's thought experiment. Um, and th the general consensus in the way we run society is that this thought experiment actually correctly yields, it, it, it yields the right result. This is the way we should run the world. But now there's some very interesting questions. So, so we can question both of these principles. So we can question the principle of equal liberty and we can question the principle of difference. Um, so I, I think there's interesting objections to both. So when we question the principle of liberty, the question is, should everyone get exactly the same liberty? Um, well, there's gonna be obvious exceptions, right? So certain people should have less liberty. It's those people who perhaps are not, um, they're not full members of society. Maybe they're criminals, for example. Also, we have to cash out equal opportunity properly. You know, in order to give everyone equal opportunity, that might mean taking away quite a lot from certain people or boosting other people up quite a lot. For example, if you started off with very, very little, you might need an enormous boost in order to get to where someone else is who started off with a lot. So, you know, there's in interesting questions about whether the principle of liberty is correct. And there's interesting questions about whether the principle of difference is correct. So the principle of difference is the person at the bottom should get enough to survive or enough to be happy, um, even if that means taking away some of the things from the people at the top. And there might be some reasons we have for thinking that that's not the case. Yeah, so um, Nozick is one of the sort of famous uh, critics of Rawls. Nozick's a libertarian. He wrote uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And he has this phrase, which is that, you know, um, taxation basically amounts to theft and slavery. Um, the idea is that when you take away someone's money that they earn through their own free labor efforts um, and you give it to other people, you're, you're stealing it from them. And because they use their labor to make it, you are treating that person like a slave for someone else's benefit. So, you know, whenever we say, well, wouldn't it be nice for everyone to be able to, you know, sit around the table and eat this pie together, we've got to say, but hold on a second, who made this pie? Um, you know, maybe there's people that, that could really well benefit from it, but do they have a right to it? And Rawls seems to think that, you, that we would all want to grant those rights to people because of their original position. Um, and, you know, because we don't know how vulnerable we'll be, we might be in a position where we're born in a way in which we aren't able to make any income. So Rawls thinks that our natural talents um, are actually matters of luck. In other words, if you happen to be born with an incredible athletic ability, and because of that, you're able to compete in the Olympics or in Wimbledon and make a lot of money, well, you know, he thinks that you're just born that way. You've got the genetic advancement, and that's not due to your own efforts. Uh, or if you're born, um, you know, very, very intelligent, you know, that's not because of you. Um, that's sort of the genetic advantage. And so you shouldn't be able to profiteer off of that. You know, those that were born disabled or uh, in mentally enfeebled, well, it wasn't their, it wasn't their fault. Um, and, you know, because we don't know where we'll wind up, we want a system in place which tries to cater for everyone. Well, you know, this, this is a problem for both the principle of difference and for the principle of equality um, of liberty or opportunity. So, um, you know, an underlying question, which a lot of people are quite uncomfortable to ask, is are all people equally valuable or deserving? In other words, does everyone actually deserve to be treated equally? Um, and I, I mean, my personal view is no. It, it's actually very hard to 
provide an argument for equality? You know, why is it the case that everyone should be treated equally? So if the argument is, I should be treated equally to everyone else and being given equal opportunity and make sh made sure that I get enough in society to survive and be relatively happy, well, then that means that I deserve it, right? Okay. And the idea is that um, I deserve it and I, and I believe that I deserve it because when we take off the bandages, it will be me and I'm going to want this, right? I'm going to want this. But, but, you know, if you're a perfectly rational person, and this is something Rawls kind of includes in the calculation from this thought experiment, he says, the person in the bandages is, is kind of a perfectly rational person. They're very bright, they're very smart, and they can kind of think through ethics, and they can kind of think through what's right and wrong. And suppose I were to say to that person in the bandages, it might, you know, when your amnesia lifts, you might be that person, you might be the person who's a bad person the person who has very little and who deserves to have very little, do you think then you should still be given enough? Do you think you should still be given equal, equality of opportunity and enough resources to continue? Perhaps you're a really revolting person. Perhaps you, you go out there and you, you murder little babies, right? Should you, should you be given enough? Um, or perhaps you just, you're just a really nasty guy, right? Should you be given the same as everyone else? Do you deserve it? And, if that's a perfectly rational person wrapped up in the bandages, maybe they'll say no. You know, maybe I don't deserve it. Yes, I suppose the question is how deep your amnesia is. I mean, let's say we said you may have committed a crime. Um, what level of punishment do you think there should be if you were the person who committed the crime? You know, you might be very risk averse. You might say, well, if I committed a crime, you know, and I can't remember it, well, you know, I think I should be let free. Uh, because I don't want to spend any time in prison. But you might think, well, the other guy in the bandages next to me, if he's a criminal, I hope we lock him up and throw away the key. You know, I don't want him <laughs> posing a danger to me. So we're starting to see that there's some limits on this experiment. There's another way in which we could envisage it. So as I say, which is not just this perfectly rational individual, but a kind of community of people. So we can imagine that what the doctor does is he gets 100 of us out of these hospital beds, and we're all in our bandages and we're deliberating through this process. It might be that we, we only have so much personal knowledge, um, and you know, in other words, knowledge about the nature of, of, uh, of how economic systems work and human psychology works, and we wanna bounce ideas off of other people, and we'd want some sort of uh, deliberative democracy even behind the veil, so we could start thinking about the institutions that govern us in this world. Now, part of what Rawls is doing is saying, look, I know we're not in the original position. I know we're not all wearing veils. But if that position would lead to a just society and we compare that to the world in which we are, we can then see how unjust our world is in comparison. And then he thinks you, because you accepted these principles uh, in the original position, well, you should accept them afterwards and you should modify your society accordingly. Um, now, what Rawls does is he kind of draws out some comparisons with with his theory, he sees himself as a Kantian, a rights theorist, he thinks rights really matter. And he's contrasting his view with utilitarianism. And you know, utilitarians say, well, what's going to yield you know, the best results? And there's different ways you could cash that out. Um, so one of the ways that Rawls thinks about this sort of distribution, you could have, for example, what will lead to the total amount of good okay, in a society? So all we do is sort of add up people's levels of pleasure and pain, we attribute points to each person, and then we add up the totals and we say, well, in society A, we got a million points, and in society B, we got 100,000 points. So society A is a better society because we've got more points. And Rawls points out, he says, well, there might be a problem with this way of thinking, this total utility. Because what if I told you that in that society where we have a million points in total, there's only there's one person who has 990,000 of those points. He's the utility monster. He's managed to you know, garner enormous amounts of pleasure and, and tends to enjoy things much more than everyone else does. So when, uh, when you give him things, he's just so much more delighted than other people. And so it sort of creates this obligation. And he says the problem with that is instead of treating people like individuals, you treat them as mere vessels of utility. Um, instead of them being good of themselves, we just go, how much utility is there in the society? It's almost like these, you know, this glass is filled with water. And instead of caring about the glass, I care how much water it can have in it. And I care about the total amount of water. And I don't mind if some glasses have no water in them at all, any joy in them at all. So the other move is you say, okay, well, let's not think about total utility. Let's talk about average utility. How do people do on average? Um, 
And so that's another way of which you, know, you could try and cash out society. Have you got, got any thoughts on that as a problem? Yeah. So, I mean, utilitarians have all sorts of solutions to this problem. You know, the one is the average solution, but then you, you're going to get into some weird situations. Okay. So um, averages are pulled up or down still by utility monsters. So if you have a look at a, a, um, a whole bunch of numbers, um, they might all be, to, be between one and 10 and one is a million, right? So all but one is, is between one and 10 and one is a million. It's going to pull that average right up, right? So you've still got the same problem. Um, everyone's doing badly except for one person. And according to the average utilitarian, that's going to be a good society to be in. But obviously it's not because everyone's unhappy except for the one guy. So utilitarians have various ways of doing, of dealing with this problem. So one solution is to put maximums on people, maximums and minimums. So you don't want people who are going to be utility monsters either, either in a positive or a negative way. You don't want people who are going to weigh the, the, the equation too heavily up or down. So someone who's incredibly happy with life or, or someone who's incredibly upset with life. There's other ways of dealing with it. So um, you can also only look at suffering, not happiness. Um, so that eliminates the people that, um, that, suff that, that are incredibly happy. Or you can look only at, at happiness and not suffering. And that looks only at the people who are happy and not those who are sad. So there's different ways that utilitarians get around this. Um, I, so my t I'm a utilitarian and the kind of utilitarianism I like is lexicographic utilitarianism. So what that means is there's like these categories of pleasures, these categories of happiness and ca categories of harm or pain. And some of these categories are just way more important than other categories and no amount in each category will get you to the next. They're like, there's like, there's like chop off points at various, at various stages. So it's a lexicographic scale. And the idea is that, um, you, you structure your society in such a way that you aim your society to get as much of the highest categories of pleasure as possible. So this was um, an idea from the original utilitarians and hedonists like um, Bentham. And Bentham said that not all pleasures are equally important. Um, for example, he thought that like sexual pleasure is not as important as the pleasure of listening to Bach, for example. I disagree with that, by the way, but, but, um, but the point is that, that he said that certain pleasures are more important than others, and you need to aim at those pleasures, and there are limits within, within the category, right? So you can't be a million utility monster within that category. There's, there's upper and lower limits, and so you structure your society in that way. So there's all these objections to rules, but let's, let's put the objections aside for a moment. We can see that Rawls is being used today to consider whether or not we should lock down in the time of COVID. Yeah, so it seems like we're taking his um, maximum principle pretty seriously, which is we should do that which will maximize the minimum. And so who are the minimum in our society? Well, it's the elderly, uh, it's people with pre-existing health conditions. So those with um, you know, heart disease, um, asthma, uh, you know, who, are, who if they get it are you know, at a high likelihood of dying. And so what we've done is we've said, well, their rights must be prioritized um, over everyone else. So we've taken a whole bunch of uh, people who are young and healthy um, and who could participate in the economy and lead normal lives. And if they got COVID, would in all likelihood survive. There are, of course, cases of uh, young people um, getting sick and um, it being a very painful, awful thing to get sick and some of them dying. Um, but we know that the sort of the, the distribution of suffering is very different depending on where you fall. And what we've done is this kind of Rawlsian calculation where we say we should structure our society in a way to maximize the minimum, even if it is to the massive detriment of all these other people. Yeah, and it gets very interesting because you can, you can change the world that we live in. You know, you can, you can imagine the world having different mortality rates to the disease and different numbers of people being infected in such a way that you develop counter examples to roles. So right now it's very unclear whether, and this is what we argue, or at least what I argue and what Mark and I discuss in the previous episode, it's very unclear whether lifting a lockdown or not will result in net utility, positive or negative. We're not 100% sure because the data is so muddy. But you can imagine a world where the data is not muddy, right? So you can imagine a world where there's actually very few people that would be infected and die from COVID 
if they were infected, if they got the disease. So imagine it's not, say, a mortality rate of, like I argued in the previous episode, between 3 and 12%. Imagine it's a mortality rate of 0.1%, right? Just imagine that for a moment. If that was the case, there would only be very, very few people at risk. But according to Rawls's difference principle, according to this maximum principle, you should go out of your way as a society as a whole to protect them. Yes, and you might say, in other words, if I, when I'm in the hospital bed and I say, I don't know whether I'm going to be in this vulnerable group or not, um, so I guess I should put in a place a position which will protect me. And so one of the things that Rawls sort of seems to grapple with is this problem of you know, how risk-averse people are. So it seems to matter, in other words, if I'm going to make the decision, I want to know, well, what are the chances that I'm going to wind up in this vulnerable group? Uh, you know, if it's a million to one, I might very well say, well, I'll roll the dice. Um, I'd much rather live in a freer, more prosperous world, and there's a million to one chance that I'm going to wind up in immense suffering. Um, and it versus in a society where I say to you, look, it's, you know, it's one in 10 that, you, that you're gonna wind up being very vulnerable, in which case you might become much, much more risk averse. So those sorts of problems seem to make, make a difference. Um, and you know, Rawls can't really cater for that problem. Yeah, I think that the problem for Rawls is that he's a Kantian. So this is a perpetual argument between Mark and I because I'm a utilitarian and Mark has some Kantian leanings. And utilitarians, what we believe is all that matters is the consequences of an action. That's what determines whether it's right or wrong. Kantians think that we have these inherent inviolable duties, right? And one of the duties is to respect life, respect people, respect, respect people's dignity. And the problem is that you know, it's very hard to then insert a utility calc of rolling and rolling dice and risk into um, an inviolable duty. It's very hard to marry those two ideas together. Rawls is trying to do that, but it, you know, it conceptually, it's very hard to do it. The utilitarian is a very simple answer. The utilitarian says, you know, what is going to result in the most happiness for society as a whole? Do that, right? The, the, the Kantian and the Rawlsian says, wait, 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 we can't do that. We can't just throw people under the trolley, right? We can't push the fat man off the bridge. We've got to be very careful here. By the way, if you're not sure what we're referring to by the fat man and the bridge and the trolley, tune into our first episode on the trolley problem. It's, I think it's really good. I'm very biased about this, but it's fine because I'm a utilitarian and the utilitarian will tell you that you're going to love it and it's going to improve your day. So listen to the first episode. Um, but yeah, so, so question here is, you know, what are states allowed to do? What should the state do? And I think we've established that on the original position and on Rawls's position, the state is going to say, you know, unless the, the percentages are incredibly low, uh, the percentage risk when you're in the original position of waking up and having the disease, the state is going to say you should protect those who are vulnerable. So you've used an interesting term there, which is should protect. So I think let's think about this question of what is the obligation of the state? So our one view is the sort of big state, this, the state that sort of is, is like a parent, you know, it looks after you, um, it provides for you, there's a safety net that, you know, if things go wrong in your life, or you go through a hard time, the state will be there to kind of make sure that when you fall, it catches you. So, you know, there's um, going to be an unemployment insurance fund, um, there's going to be maybe a basic income grant, um, or if you get sick, um, you know, the state will pay for your, for your hospitalization. Uh, maybe it'll pay for your education so that you get a good chance at competing. Um, but of course, it's not the state that's paying. It is all citizens that are paying, you know, because the state has no money um, besides that which it extracts from its citizens. So, you know, the idea is, well, what's the moral justification for being able to take from some and give to others? Well, Rawls says we would have agreed to that. We want the safety net in place. Um, and so we would have all agreed, even if you don't agree now, you would have agreed in the hypothetical circumstance and that's sufficient. I don't need actual agreement, I don't need a real contract, all I need is my heuristic device, my hypothetical contract. But other people are gonna say, well, hold on, no, no, no. The state must have a much more minimal role. Uh, the state can be there to sort of um, administer justice, it's quite good at doing that, so it can have a police force, it can catch criminals, it can in incarcerate them, it can provide a, a court system, so when people have disputes, they can, they can have a place where they can litigate. Um, and maybe it does some basic infrastructure, so it can build the roads and you know, things like that. But otherwise, other people must pay for their own services. So if you want an education, well, then you save up enough money so that you can get an education. And if you fall sick, 
well, you should have an insurance policy in place, you know, um, and that's up to you. Um, and, you know, that means that some people are going to fall on hard times and there will be no safety net. Um, and so those that believe in a minimal state sort of say, well, either that's your tough luck or, well, that's not the only source of support. That's, you know, we don't just need states to pick us up, as I mentioned. We can have uh, communities and we can have family. Um, so you can rely on free transfers between people. That, you know, states didn't always play this big role. There was private charity. Um, so there's other ways of sort of ameliorating some of the harsher effects of not having a big state. So this is the libertarian view, right? So libertarianism is quite different from a Rawlsian view, which is a social democracy. The libertarian says what matters most is people's freedom. And the state should not be removing freedoms from people. It should not be removing their resources, like their money, and giving it to other people. The state should only act in such a way that it maximizes people's liberty or their freedom. And there, it's a very interesting question whether the state, on a libertarian view, is allowed to implement a lockdown. Um, I imagine today most libertarians would say no. Any suggestions as to why, Mark? Yeah, so I think if you're a libertarian, you say, well, freedom really matters quite, you know, quite a severe way. You know, they, they also, uh, libertarians come in two different camps. You get libertarians who are utilitarian. In other words, they say that having all these freedoms in place tends to maximize the good. And then you get the Kantian sort who say, well, there are certain basic rights that everyone has, and we can't have them infringed, even if it generates goods. Um, so, but the libertarian is going to say, well, when you restrict people's movement, when you tell them, you know, where they're allowed to travel, where they can work, um, you know, that's a, uh, it's an infringement that is, you know, unconscionable and you can't do it. The other route is you say, well, hold on. If, if we let the state come in and protect us from bad guys and, you know, have an army so that it can protect us in a case of war, well, you know, are we fighting a war with, uh, you know, an invisible enemy as, you know, some of the sort of metaphorical language has been that's really COVID is this invading force and the state is then justified in exercising its powers to protect citizens. And it might not be sufficient to say to people, well, if you're worried about getting sick, just stay at home, you know, um, because you've got all these people who are going to be milling around um, who are going to be sort of carrying a disease, either knowingly they're sick and they're, they're going to get other people sick. Um, and then we might think, well, maybe the state's got a good role in saying this person is a danger, an active danger, an, an intentional assaulter, um, and we can, you know, force them to stay at home or maybe force them into a, into a state quarantine. Um, but then you've got all these people who are innocent, who, in other words, are asymptomatic carriers, um, who think that they're, they're not at risk and they don't pose a risk to others. You know, can the state constrain their freedom? It's a bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, so there's this very interesting line that libertarians have to straddle. And that line is how easily do they step into what's called paternalism? So paternalism is the view that the state can do things to force you to protect yourself, right? So the state can force you, let's say, to wear a seatbelt or not to take that hit of cocaine or um, in this case, to isolate during a pandemic. Okay, so the question is, um, does the state have the right to step into paternalism on a libertarian view? Most libertarians would say no. So most libertarians don't want paternalism mixed up with the state. They want their guiding principle to be a principle of liberty, which, by the way, comes from John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was also the originator of utilitarianism. So you can see, as Mark said earlier, that libertarianism and utilitarianism go hand in hand. They both came from the same progenitor and they mix very well together. Um, Mill was very much against paternalism. He talked about two different types of paternalism. There's soft paternalism and hard paternalism. Soft paternalism is that um, you, can, you can tell people not to do certain things if those people are uh, compromised in some way. So for example, let's say they're not particularly rational, maybe they're children or maybe they're, uh, they're not in their right minds, then you can do things to make sure that they don't harm themselves. So for example, let's say the question is euthanasia, we, whether you should allow people to euthanize themselves or not with, assisted, with assistance, um, you would say, no, you can't if you're not in your right mind. So if you're particularly depressed at the time, then no, you can't. But once you're thinking straight, then you can. Unless you're a hard paternalist, in which case you think that the state has the ability to step in and help everyone, regardless of their mental state, regardless of whether they're in their right mind or not, regardless of whether they're rational at the time. So libertarians definitely do not want hard paternalism. 
they generally don't want soft paternalism, but some will kind of, you know, like skirt the lines. Now the question is, is a lockdown hard paternalism, soft paternalism, or just pure libertarianism? And it seems to me like it's hard libertar it's hard paternalism. In other words, it's telling people what to do regardless of their state of mind. Well, so let's think about this, this question. So if I tell someone, we're going to forbid you from drinking because drinking is bad for your health. That, that seems like, you know, the paternalism in action. In other words, um, I say, I want to do what's best for you and you don't have your own interest at heart. Um, so I'm going to stop you from hurting yourself. Okay. That's different to the case where the state says, when you are really drunk, we're going to stop you from getting in your car and driving. Because there it's not, we said, they said, I don't mind if you want to kill yourself in a car accident. The problem is you're going to kill other people. Um, and we care about them and we don't want you performing wrongs on them. And the difficulty with COVID, of course, is, um, you know, we might say, well, you're kind of like a drunk driver. You know, you're in the state of self-harm when, you, when you're sick, but you also pose a risk to others. And so I don't have to invoke any paternalism to restrict your freedom. I can just say that you are like someone you know, uh, negligently going out um, and dishing out harms and suffering to others against them. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. So your idea is that, remember earlier you said that you can throw your fist, but only so far as it just before it reaches my nose, right? So that's the, that's the libertarian principle in action. And that's the principle that Rawls took. And that's the principle that, Jay, that John Stuart Mill took. The, the problem that COVID po poses is that you know, that, that, that distance between harming me and not harming, is, harming me is no longer an inch. It's not an inch from my nose. It's now two meters, right? So if you're within two meters of me, you're harming me. And the problem is we live in densely populated societies. John, John Stuart Mill didn't live in as densely populated a society back then. Populations have increased over time. We live in big cities especially here in Johannesburg, where we are, um, we're actually in the epicenter of the South African, um, at least in terms of frequency, the number of cases. We have the most cases in our little area in Santon in South Africa and Johannesburg. We live very dense in a very densely populated area. You don't, you don't have, you know, in this case, all I would need is someone to stand within two meters of me, sneeze, and I could have COVID or cough and I could have COVID. So now the restrictions you know, now rules as principle, does it now say that you can't swing your fist at me within one inch? Now does it say you can't swing your fist at me within two meters? And that becomes much more complex and much more difficult because so much of our lives involve interaction within two meters, right? You've got to interact with a shop teller and give over your card and they take your goods to process them. Or you go to a garage and here we have garage attendants who are within two meters of you and you've got a police officer who, who he tells you to wind down your window and he's right next to you and you've got people at work at the desk next to you or lean over you to show you something on the screen or there's just infinite infinite iterations infinite ways in which we need to be within each other's space in order for society to function so your point is that we could cash it out for the libertarian not as um we're going to help you protect yourself from yourself we're going to protect you from others who are going to harm you by making sure they don't come within two meters of you we're going to protect you from others and we're going to protect all the others from you because we're going to have the situation of the asymptomatic spreaders. So we don't know, you know, who the assaulter is, who the danger is. And so we then say for, you know, the sort of benefit of citizens, uh, the benefit of others, um, not for you particularly, we're going to impose these restrictions. Um, so everyone's driving around in a car, right? And you don't know who the drunk driver is. So you make sure there's no cars on the road. <laughs> yes so i mean this is the other interesting problem we have as well so if we think about our kind of utilitarian justifications we say well you know we accept that you know people are going to misbehave um and they're going to pose risk to others and we don't shut down our society because of those risks so you know we don't have a total shutdown because um they're drunk drivers or people who are you know um, getting into bar fights and could be killing each other, you know, we sort of tolerate some level of risk um, because we think that actually that yields greater goods. If people are able to, um, you know, act freely, they can generate money, they can lead all the kind of lexicographical pleasures that you mentioned, you know, they can you know, engage in great social activities, all sorts of things. And if they're deprived of that stuff, they lead, you know, much, much poorer lives. You know? 
Yeah, so, so that is one way that a libertarian can argue that, and I think many are in practice, arguing that there should be no lockdowns. But there's, there's a problem, right? We said Rawls has problems, but the libertarian has problems too. So remember I said earlier, we don't really know what the true infection rate in society is, and we don't really know what the true mortality rate is, but let's imagine for a moment, not that it's very low, but that it's very high. So let's imagine that there's a high infection rate, not, in, not everyone who has it, but let's say a third of society has it, or a quarter of society has it. So it's, it's a lot of people, but it's not everyone. So there's still the majority of people to protect from getting it. And at the same time, let's imagine that the mortality rate is not between 3 and 12%. Let's imagine it's 25%. Let's imagine, like with MERS, it was close to 30%. So let's imagine it's 30%, right, with MERS. So let's, let's imagine we've got MERS floating around society. So now the libertarian has a problem because the libertarian is going to find it more and more difficult to perform the utilitarian calc and come out and say that there's going to be a balance of good over bad if we open up the economy and let people you know, mingle freely. So the problem is for the libertarian is that he's, he's relying on optimistic numbers to come in over time, which we don't have yet. And um, he's relying on, for example, antibody tests to show that the whole of society has this or the most of society has this and most of them don't get very sick. He's, he's hoping for that, right? And if that comes in, he's lucky. It's great. You know, we live in that world where that's the case. And then, okay, you know, open up society. And, and we were right all this time. The libertarian was right all this time. But the problem for the libertarian is, what if that isn't the world we're in? And what if, even if it's not COVID, the next disease is that disease, where we have this very um, infectious disease that has a very high mortality rate. Will the libertarian then be comfortable with saying, okay, we do support a lockdown? So that's the difficulty, the tension, the the, the, the discomfort that the libertarian has to sit with. So let's think uh, a little bit more abstractly. So let's say we're thinking about the kind of society that we want. And the sort of traditional model has been, well, we think democracies are important because um, everybody gets an opportunity to participate. You know, you can vote for your leaders. Um, you know, we can have these, these guys kind of at the end of an election run our society. Now, the problem is when you're in a state of crisis, when you have to act very rapidly, do you have the time to sort of you know, elect a ship captain? So imagine we're on a ship um, and uh, we decide, well, let's work out who should steer it. And we run a little election and the best looking, sweetest talking, most popular guy says, you know, you should vote for me. And everybody says, oh, he's so dashing. We should definitely have this guy as a ship captain. And the sort of guy with a bit of a hunch on his shoulder, you know, sort of speaks a bit like a, a sailor, you know, not, not very, not very likable, but who actually is a trained sailor who'd be very good at steering the ship, you know, would have been the better pick, right? So, you know, the problem with democracy is you don't always pick the best people. Now, let's add a little bit to our experiment. It's not a sunny day um, where we can tolerate, you know, the good looking guy who sort of says he knows what he's doing on the ship and, you know, there's not too much wrong you can do. Um, our ship is sinking, you know, or we're heading towards an iceberg. Um, should we allow people to sort of deliberate and have these discussions and work out who they want to lead them and follow all these democratic processes, which you know, often take much more time? Or do we want uh, the autocrat to step in? And he says, I am the most skilled to deal with this. Uh, I am Victor Orban, and uh, I'm just dissolving parliament. And what I say goes. Um, and we need one captain to lead us through this difficult voyage. And don't worry, once this, you know, the storm passes, then we can get back to, you know, that sort of democratic stuff. Yeah, so on the one, you know, we started with Rawls, right? So Rawls is a, a relatively centrist position. And then we went libertarian, which is a bit right of Rawls, okay? So the idea is the state has less control over us than in, in a Rawlsian state. Now we're going left of Rawls, okay? And we're saying, okay, if, if we don't want to go libertarianism and, and, and Rawls has problems, maybe the problem isn't that the state has too much, uh, too much power. Maybe we need to give the state more power, right? And have this authoritarian figure step in who knows what to do and he just does it. And that's kind of what has happened in a lot of states. Um, you know, in South Africa, uh, we've declared, it's not a state of emergency, is it, Mark? What no, is it called? We've, we've declared a state of disaster. The difference is state of emergency um, must, can only be done under certain conditions. Um, if there's a natural catastrophe, you can do it. But you also have to declare it to restore the nation back to a state of peace and order. Um, and what it does, it's very dramatic, is basically a lot of the rights in our Bill of Rights um, disappear. 
Um, so they, they immediately get scrapped. Um, there are a couple that stay in place, so the right to life remains there, but free speech, privacy, um, business, property, all of that stuff disappears immediately under a state of emergency. And so the state can exercise these strong measures you know, to restore things back to a state of uh, peace and order is the idea. And there's some room for parliamentary intervention and it has a, a constitutional time limits involved, but we're not there yet. But what we are seeing is the kind of rise of the strongman. So we have presidential addresses from President Ramaphosa in South Africa. Um, they you know, have some level of comforting this to them. In other words, we've got the dear leader standing on television and telling everyone it's going to be okay. And you know, I have a solution for you along with the uh, COVID command council, this new body that has been sort of created out of statutory thin air um, to lead the nation and provide you know, us with some certainty. And so we can never step forward and all sorts of um, limitations on our rights, which you know, many of which have yet to be challenged in the courts. So we're not at a state of emergency yet, but we are at a state of disaster. Um, have I got those right? Yes, yeah. not mixed up. Right. So, but the point is that we could go that way, right? You know, conceivably, and it already elevates the power of the state massively and could be massively elevated beyond that. So we are going further and further left on our, on our continuum, right? We're giving the state uh, more and more power. And, you know, the question is, is that the way to go? Well, you know, some people would be very uncomfortable with it, right? So the libertarians are certainly uncomfortable with it. Um, and maybe for good reason. So, you know, it's one thing when you have a dictator who is benevolent. In other words, he does everything right and he wants to do the right thing. And let's say he's even effective in doing so. You know, that, that, that can work out quite well in certain ways in a, in a, state, in a state of disaster. But, you know, there's also the, the problem that, the, you know, the, the, the dictator is not infallible. In other words, he can make mistakes. And those, you know, that's the risk is, you know, if you put everything on the shoulders of one man, his, his shoulders can crumble or he could be quite pernicious. In other words, he, he could take the opportunity to make poor decisions and there's nothing that his citizens can do to stop him. So one of the sort of traditional problems with the, the kind of dictator or command style way of running things is that, as you said, they're not infallible, they make mistakes and they're, they're not superhuman. So they don't know everything. So you might find that command councils are able to kind of think about the immediate consequences. So they say, well, we need to, we need to act swiftly to stop this disease. So how do we stop the disease? Well, we stop people from seeing each other. So we, we ban all movement. Um, and you know, necessarily that means you ban all economic activity or most of it. And you say, well, we stopped the original problem. Ah, great, excellent. But they don't think about the secondary consequences. Like what about all the people that are going to die of starvation because they can't feed themselves? Uh, what about the sort of long-term so you know, social and psychological consequences? These things are, are hard to sort of perceive as a small body. Um, also, you know, the, the, we're now sort of entering some phase of, uh, of opening up from our lockdown. We're going to be entering to, you know, different uh, alert levels. So we're currently at an alert five and, you know, uh, we'll be moving to an alert four, which allows for more parts of the economy to open up a little bit more bits of freedom. Um, and the question is, well, is this command council going to be the best body for determining when we should move up and down on the alert scale? Does it have all the information? Is it going to be acting for the right reasons? Um, is it going to be able to sort of perceive all of the possible consequences of changing alerts? You know, one, one of the good examples about, you know, free markets versus economies, in Russia, the idea was, well, um, the state knows what's best for you. So we're going to produce a certain number of shoes and a certain number of jeans, and we're going to try and do this calculation. And um, then everyone can have je jeans and boots. And what you found was there were always um, oversupplies of some things and undersupplies of others. So the state was very bad at working out what color jeans people wanted or what, what the size distribution should be of your shoes. Whereas markets don't have those problems because you've got all these signals in the market. People tell you what they want. And you know, if there isn't enough of it, then you start making more of it because there's a higher demand. Um, so you can sort of act very quickly. Um, I mean, what's interesting is sort of seeing how, you know, market flexibility can be quite useful in this time of crisis. You know, that's, you know, a, a good example is the states around the world said, from the information we have, ventilators are a serious problem. We need to have more ventilators. And so we're going to force firms to start making ventilators. So for, for firms started reconverting their factories and putting out ventilators. 
One of them, Dyson, has now just stopped doing it on the basis that um, the demand for ventilators was thought to be much higher than it really is. Um, that actually they're a lot less, like, less useful addressing the pandemic than expected, and that hospitals have a much lower demand. So that command-driven approach seemed look at, like a good idea, but actually if there'd been a sort of market way of doing things, um, we might not have run into this oversupply problem. So really what's very interesting is that there's a luck problem on both sides. So both the libertarian and the authoritarian both have a luck problem. So the libertarian's luck problem is that they hope that the utility calculations will come out in such a way that it supports having a free market as the best possible outcome, right? It'll give you the best outcome. And I said like a case like um, rampant MERS would, would belie that. It would be a counterexample. And the authoritarian also has a luck problem. So the authoritarian, you are lucky if you get your command um, economy right, right? So for, for the authoritarian, you hope that they make the right decisions, make sure that they create the correct number of ventilators, not too many, not too few. You hope that they have the correct risk levels for your society as a whole. You hope that they make all these decisions in the right way. And they might, but they might not. And it's lucky if they do. So there's a luck problem for both the left and the right, for the, to for the totalitarians and the libertarians. Now, I know that there's going to be some libertarians who are listening to this who are going to object to my view of calling the libertarians the right. They often call themselves centrist. Um, and we can debate endlessly about this, but I'm just saying left of um, Rawlsian, Rawlsians, Rawlsianism versus right of Rawlsianism. Um, so left or right of social democracy. So I, I want to go a lot more right than the libertarians, as Mark knows. So I'm not a libertarian, I'm an anarchist. So an anarchist believes not that the state should have this minimal role, but that the state should not exist at all, right? Um, and on that view, you get a very different kind of outcome. And I think you get the outcome that you want, which is that there should be no lockdown, lockdown, right? So according to an anarchist, there should be no lockdown because a lockdown is impl implemented by a state and a state should not exist according to an anarchist. But here's what an anarchist would say could exist, right? There could be something like this. An anarchist could say, well, you have no right to, to um, infringe on the liberties of others as a state or as an individual. Um, so for example, if I'm a supermarket, I can say to you, you cannot come inside without a mask right? Why? Because it's my store, I own it, and I'm telling you, you can't come inside unless you have a mask. Or I might say to you, you cannot come inside unless you maintain a two meter distance between you and the other customers. And if you don't, I'm going to kick you out. I can do that because it's my supermarket, not because the government has told me to, and a different supermarket can have a different set of rules. But these are my rules. When you, when you step through the door, I've got a sign on my door that says, Nobody within two meters of each other and everyone must, everyone must wear a mask. And that seems to me to be the best solution. The best solution is for individuals to decide on their level of risk, individuals including companies. And once that happens, you know, the market will self-modulate, right? So here we don't have a market of, of exchange of goods and currency. We have a market of risk. So you've got all these individuals, whether they be companies or persons, and those persons decide how much risk they're willing to engage in. And they tell the people around them that they may not engage in more risk than that with them. And that's that way the society kind of modulates. So here's a little concern for your anarchist model. We've scrapped the state. There's, there's no central body for enforcing your right to property. And it's not just me who comes into the store without a mask. It's me and my hundred friends and we're all carrying baseball bats. And uh, we say, we don't want to pay you for your goods. We're going to take them. And you say, but they're mine. I have a right to property. These are my goods. And I say, I don't care. I'm stronger than you. And so are my friends. And we're taking all this stuff. What are you going to do about it, chump? And so <laughs> the difficulty that you have as an anarchist is you have no, no sort of uh, neutral authority to respect your so-called rights. You know, all you could do maybe is band together with the other spa stores, hire your own you know, paramilitary force to fight off the thugs. Um, but we see here that we sort of wind up possibly in a kind of Hobbesian state of nature where life is uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And it's the war of all against all. Um, of course, I, I have the worry that you know, uh, Jason's anarchist account may be the one that we're going to be living in very soon as you know, states collapse <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the thugs take over. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people would argue that in South Africa, we already live in that situation um, where the police doesn't provide the major role in, in uh, making sure that criminal behavior doesn't happen in South Africa. It's really private security firms that do it. Um, so we might already be living in such a state. Um, and I just want to formalize it, basically. I'm not saying that, uh, that such a state is, is, uh, is ideal. I just think it's the best of these bad alternatives. So we've seen that there's problems with each, right? Um, and I'm saying, oh, yeah, there's going to be some problems with mine, sure. Um, but I, I, you've got no conceptual problem here. In other words, you know, there's no, there's no problem of, you know, luck. There's no luck problem. Um, people are going to act in their self-interest and they're going to protect the, what they perceive their rights to be. Um, and some people may do it successfully and some people may not. But that's the case even in a democracy, in a Rawlsian situation. So one of the things that, that Rawls talks about is this idea of you know, his situation leads to uh, political stability, that because there's a kind of collective buy-in of these norms, that we've all kind of accepted it through a rational process, that we're less likely to want to be disruptors. We say, well, you know, this allocation of rights and resources is fair. It's what I would have agreed to. And he thinks it's important that people have a notion of being democratic citizens and that they imbibe the norms and that that makes them um, not just you know, act in accordance with it, believe that what they're doing is right. And the difficulty with that sort of anarchist account is that it's, you know, it's very easy to sort of imagine these politically unstable situations and that there's a cost to doing that. In other words, if I know that my co-citizens have bought into notions about, you know, justice and, and that if there is a dispute that it can be adjudicated in a fair manner, that I don't have to pay for, you know, a big, you know, private army all the time, uh, uh, you know, that there'll be a sort of fair process for adjudicating things well. I'm much more likely to act in a way that respects people's rights. Um, now, you know, it seems like you kind of have these anarchist movements, which are very small. In other words, these you know communities of 30, where the community has sort of imposed its own set of rules, um, and there's some sort of free form. But for it to work in a very big, complicated society, I mean, even just this notion about saying, well, every little store can set up its own rules. You know, the nightmare of having to work your way through the labyrinth of different norms. You know, on this patch of, uh, of road, you know, run by this group of people, you drive on the left, but as soon as you pass that, you have to drive on the right. You know, it's sort of, you know, there's some usefulness in being, to, being able to have a coordination, um, which is sort of set by a central authority. Now, that might happen organically. So, for example, if you think about um, the sort of fight over USB cables, you know, different companies have different sizes. Apple had their own cable. You know, these guys had a micro cable, these guys had this thing. And eventually what happens is through a process of emergent order, we've now settled on a certain standardized cable. Um, and that all works for the mutual benefit of all of us. Um, that we can realize, well, I don't need a state telling me that I have to do it this way. It might just be in my interest to sort of negotiate with my competitors. Um, and then we'll all benefit from that. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for solving the problem that you put to me, Mark. <laughs> I think it's a great solution. <laughs> yeah, because if you think about the, the way corporates operate, um, they're not operating in, operating in purely, purely anarchist ways. You know, they're still operating within a state. But we can certainly imagine dystopian futures where they do operate in, in purely anarchist ways. And there's, there's lots of sci-fi novels and, and movies about exactly this. Um, and yeah, some kind of emergent order and cooperation comes about because it suits everyone involved. Um, but I do admit that, that anarchists have problems too. So, I mean, let's, let's take stock of, of where we're at, right? So we started with Rawls' position and Rawls' position is a social democracy. So you elect people and they, they are supposed to act in certain ways that uh, the people in the original position with their bandages on in hospital would have agreed to act in, in that situation. It's kind of like a social contract that we all sign. That's why it's also called social contra cont contractarianism sometimes. And then we looked at libertarianism, which is a bit right of that. And the idea is that the state should never um, uh, disrespect the liberty of any individual involved unless they're going to harm the liberty of, of someone else. And we said, well, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to say whether a lockdown would be supported on that position, and it might not always be supported under the right circumstances, and so they have this problem. We also said, um, sorry, Rawlsianism has a problem too. Then we looked on the left and we said totalitarians have an issue. You know, the problem is that your benevolent dictator, he might do the right thing, but he might not do the right thing. Um, he might choose the lockdown at the right time, and he might not. 
And then we went further right to anarchism, the position that I quite like, that Marcus points out there are some serious issues with it. And so now we're stuck, right? So we've got all these different positions and the question that people tuned in on, uh, what they wanted to know when they tuned into the show is, is it politically legitimate to lock down society? So what's our final answer? Well, I think it seems to depend on your underlying norms. So, I mean, legitimacy can sort of be cashed out in these different ways. The one is, what is the right thing to do? Uh, and we know we've got different answers to the right thing. In other words, the one which generates the most good or the one which um, doesn't violate people's rights. And we've got some complexity there, even trying to work out, well, is a lockdown you know, doing the right thing? We don't have enough information. And the other one is about, well, it doesn't matter whether you do the right thing. The question is, did you follow the right process? Did enough people get to participate in this? Um, you know, is there a collective agreement? And what we found um, you know, is that a lot of people are very happy with, with lockdowns initially. They say, this bold leadership is wonderful. We need to stop this uh, invisible enemy. Um, and so they welcome the, the strong men on board. Uh, and the difficulty is that those views change over time. As the lockdown starts to pinch, it becomes uh, less and less consensual. Um, people start to say, well, actually, this isn't really what I thought I was signing up for. And so it can have its own crisis of legitimacy on the basis that citizens um, no longer support it. So I think we, you know, the difficulty, of course, is, you know, philosophers are very good at answering or posing questions. Uh, and we can sort of give different sort of dispositional answers, depending on what the underlying norms are. Um, but there'll be some level of instability in it. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, the conclusion that I came to at the end of the morality episode was I support kind of a soft lockdown because I'm agnostic about the data. So I don't know whether the data shows, you know, high mortality rates, low mortality rates, high infection, low infection, how serious this is. We also don't know the economic consequences. And given that you use a maximum principle, you know, you make sure that the, the worst risk doesn't happen. And so you lock down. Um, now we're asking a different question. The, the question is, you know, is it politically legitimate to lock down? Not, is it moral to lock down? And there the answer seems to be, well, it depends on what you define political legitimacy as. But even if you define political legitimacy in a specific way, you define it as totalitarian or as in a Rawlsian way, social democratic way, libertarian or anarchist, there's issues for all of them, whether you support a lockdown or not. So it's, I'm going to come to a similar conclusion. It's very complicated, right? It's very complicated. So my solution to everyone is to become anarchists because if you're an anarchist, the solution is pretty simple. You don't lock down because the state is never legitimate, right? So it's a very simple answer. Mark's answer is a more like Rawlsian answer. It's like, you've got to look very carefully at the social democracy that you're in. And you know, it's complex and it's, it's going to shift up or down in favor or against a lockdown. But if you're an anarchist, it's really simple. You never lock down. Yeah, it's, it's very, very simple until the thugs, the baseball bats, rocket put your phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, one sort of little closing note. So those of you that are watching on YouTube, instead of listening on our, our audio platform, will notice that above uh, Jason's left ear is a, is a poster um, of a book that he wrote called Head On. And we alluded earlier to this um, talk of a society that runs on utilitarian principles. And uh, Head On is that thought experiment writ large. Um, and so in one of our future episodes, we're going to be talking more about uh, philosophy and literature. Um, and so Jason has written quite a lot about this in terms of his own work, but also about um, the literary works of others. So we look forward to having you on board for that new journey. Yeah, and, and, and uh, as, as a little like, like, a hot, like a pin in my, in my balloon, um, in Head On, things turn out very, very badly for society, even though it's a pure utilitarian anarchist state, which is kind of what I want, things go very badly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I do admit there's problems. Um, but yeah, stay tuned, and eventually we'll get to that episode on the philosophy of literature and science fiction and thought experiments. And uh, thanks for tuning in.